If you haven't watched the videos or read the book and understood what the concept of shielding is and effective nuclear charge, go do that before you watch this video because that's going to make everything here make a lot more sense. Now, everything to do with atomic size is going to have to do with shielding. Our inner electrons are going to shield more than our valence electrons. And the analogy I like to use for that is to imagine that the atom is like a movie theater. And right here in the nucleus, we have our movie theater with a plus charge on the screen. Now let's say it's one of those movie theaters where it's not the stadium seating. Each of these rows are going to fill up with electrons. Now the electrons are going to start out here in the front row and they're going to be watching the screen. As you go further and further back, there's more and more heads blocking your view as the outermost electron trying to see that positive charge. Effective nuclear charge is telling us that we're going to take the total plus charges and we're going to add that plus to all these minus charges that are blocking its view. Remember that mathematically that means a plus plus a negative is going to be a much smaller positive charge unless this number gets bigger. So what's going to end up happening is the charge holding the attention of this minus sign isn't going to be as big because of all of these electrons blocking the view of the positive sign. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about shielding. Now, also, I'll point out that people sitting in the same row aren't really blocking your view of the screen. So if a few more electrons walk in and join this outside radius, they're not really going to be decreasing the effect of nuclear charge. However, if at the same time you're increasing your plus charge, you're going to end up getting more and more attention onto the screen. You're going to have more attraction. Now, as we come down these groups, what we're seeing is we have a deeper and deeper movie theater. Now, the plus charge is getting bigger at the same time as the shielding is getting bigger. And so it turns out that within each of these groups, the shielding is going to be increasing and Z effective is going to stay the same as you go down a group. So the effect of nuclear charge isn't changing. But you are adding in more movie theater rows. And that means your radius is getting bigger and bigger as you go down the the table and that is an intuitive relationship. Here's the one that's not so intuitive. What about as you're coming across the period? Well, Remember what's going on there. If we're doing something like sodium to magnesium heading all the way over here toward argon, what we're saying is that we're starting out, let's see we have two, another eight, that'd be ten. Sodium is starting out with eleven electrons on its screen. As we look forward from there, we're gonna have two in the front row, two electrons in the front row. We're going to have eight electrons heading over here toward neon. So we're at 10 total electrons. As this electron looks forward, it's going to see an effective nuclear charge of plus one. Now let's say a second electron comes in and sits in the same row. That's because we had 12 protons. I'm pointing at magnesium now. We have 12 protons. We have the same number of electrons in the way. That means our effective nuclear charge is going to be a plus two. These two aren't blocking each other's view of it. It's going to be a plus two effective nuclear charge pulling them both in. Now, of course, in a real movie theater, the rows don't suddenly slide forward as a result, but on an atom, they certainly do. And you can see that right here. The radius for sodium was 1.54 angstroms. Magnesium were at 1.30 angstroms. As we come further and further across that same row, you can see that our effective nuclear charge has grown to the point where the atom ends up compressing to be about two-thirds its original size when we were talking about sodium. We started at 1.54. We're all the way down to a little bit less than one angstrom when we get to argon. You can see that that trend is true for everything. <clears throat> However, notice that there's not really much of a trend going on here in the periodic table when you're in your transition metals. Now, that also is a spot where my analogy breaks down a little bit for the movie theater, but let me remind you what's going on here. We're in the 4s orbital right here, right? You drop down to the 3d orbital, and then you come back up to the 4s. Throughout here, you're not going to be increasing the radius a lot because the radius is going to be mostly dictated by these outermost electrons, your uh, electrons that are isoelectronic with k and with ca. These ones are just increasing electrons that are sitting within your d orbitals inside, but the d orbitals don't penetrate really well, and so it ends up being a messy situation. You could actually use physics and physical relationships to determine all those radii. It's not that it's a random thing. It's just that it's such a complicated pattern, we're not going to care about it for our purposes. We just say there's not a good trend there. 
If we ignore the transition metal trend and look just at the radius from this sort of a view, the trend really jumps out. Radii are going to get much larger as you go down, and they're going to get much larger as you come across this way. Now, I want to caution you. I know that the common thing that happens is people make flashcards, and they will just drill these arrows for atomic size radius. Great, that will help you do this quickly, but make sure that you thoroughly understand the concepts behind it as well, because those are going to be things that are critical for explaining a lot of things on our exams, homework problems, and later chapters in the course.